This is an Ant Podcast Management production. Hello and welcome to What The Foe Travel Podcast. I'm Amy. And I'm Nick. On this podcast, we don't subject you to a boring slideshow of what we did on our holiday. Or a painful lecture on what visa or COVID documents you need. Through friends and experts, we learn, challenge and explore our way around the world. And we take you along for the ride. What are we talking about today then, Nick? Today, we're talking about digital nomads. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome to What The Foe Travel Podcast with Nick and Amy. Previously in part one. And you were in such a bad place and we were just thinking, what do we do? I was feeling really, really anxious and... um, yeah, this is choking me off, actually. I don't know what kind of work these people are doing, but it just doesn't seem feasible to me. If you haven't listened to part one yet, then make sure you go back or this episode won't make much sense. On with the show. Remember Stephanie? So it doesn't feel as freeing as those stinking videos with somebody with their laptop on a beach. Uh, what countries have you been to? Have you, been, have you lived and worked in? Uh, total or just with the digital nomadic part? The digital nomad thing. I don't care about all the other, all oh, the other channels. That's 20 years of my life gone. Okay. Um, <laughs> digital nomadic. We started in Croatia and then went to, yeah, went to Italy, back to Croatia. Okay. So Italy, Croatia, Spain, Romania. Yeah. So I guess four. Big question from me is anyone listening who still wants to be a digital nomad after hearing us talk about it? <laughs> Uh, talk about all the cons yeah uh, but it, it's important people know so if anyone's listening and thinking this well you know they think this will be the dream life for them but they don't know how to become a digital nomad let's say they they're a bus driver they have a job which means they have to physically be there right uh, do you have any advice for someone uh you know if they want to become a digital nomad yeah i have seen like in different travel forums and and expat groups and things people saying okay now i'm overseas i'm i'm, tar- I'm starting my digital nomad life now how can i work and i think that's probably the opposite of a good way to do it i think there's a better way to do it i think get a remote job do it for a few months at least in your home place so you get into the job so that's your familiar thing and then when you move around you know what kind of flexibility you have with the internet or with your your work deadlines or that kind of thing. So you, you're you not learning how to live the, the lifestyle, the lifestyle and the job at the same time, because that's, that's a lot to put on your plate. Thanks for that, Stephanie. Amy, you want to play a game? Well, what would be the jingle for this? Nomad or gonad, nomad or gonad, nomad or gonad. I might just use that then. Okay. You now know it's time for one of our What the Foe epic games, Nomad or Gonad. Now, I know what you're thinking. This sounds not very highbrow. You might skip ahead because, you know, you're better than that. But let me tell you, this is an incredibly educational game. Okay. So as we are talking about being digital nomads, I thought, let's go back in the past. Let's find out who the real nomads are, the nomadic people of the world who move around with their camels, their horses and their cows and learn a thing or two. But also what rhymes with nomad? Gonad. Can I tell, so what is the game supposed to be? Am I, am I supposed to tell the difference between indigenous uh, nomadic tribes and testicles? Yes, exactly. That's what I was getting to. So it's educational because you're either going to be learning about who these like nomadic tribes are, or you're going to learn a language and how to say gonad, i.e. balls. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as as a uh, as an example, this isn't actually the game. So if I said the word Bedouin, would you think that's nomad or gonad? Nomad. Exactly. The Bedouins, they are in the Sahara Desert. But if I said cojones, for example. Gonad. Testicles. Exactly. So it's just a one word answer. Okay. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go for it. So your first one is Toreg. Toreg. Mm. Oh, um it's not yeah, it doesn't it's not obvious. Um 
testicle. Gonad. You're incorrect with that oh. one, Nick. It is actually nomad. So the Toreg are a particularly resilient group and they have been around since the 4th or 5th century AD. Okay, there are about two million of them living throughout the Sahara. So they're near the Bedouin people. Wow. Okay. Okay. So they're primarily in Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso as well. Mm. But the thing that I love about this, these people is the women have quite a high status in their culture. So in Tori culture, it's the men who wear a veil instead of the women. Whoa. And also, one thing that the Torek became quite good at is astronomy. So the clear desert skies gave them every chance to observe the night sky. Whoa. There you go. Fantastic. Yeah, I've learned a lot already. Never heard of them before, Torek. Okay. And we're on question number two. The word is clink it. <laughs> clink it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it could be a word for genitalia. No, you're a, you're a bit obsessed with balls, aren't you? That's a nomadic tribe once again. So let me tell you a little bit about the clink it. It's, it's weird spelling. It actually begins with a T. So it's T-L-I-N-G-I-T, but it said clink it. But it says once a much bigger group, the clink it were, like most indigenous groups on the American continent, decimated by disease brought over by European explorers. Those damn English people... However, a community of about 15,000 still holds on its land and traditions in an area right on the border of Alaska and British Columbia. There were always a hunter-gatherer nation with a complex system of fisheries that allowed them to always have food. Food was unsurprisingly an important feature of the culture and they relied on a varied diet consisting of fish, seals and seaweed from the ocean, plus berries and other plants from the forest. Today, the Clinkit people no longer follow the old way of life, which is really sad. Uh, yeah, I mean, nicest people are still around, not many of them, but yeah, shame that they're now living the, the modern way. Yeah. But uh, great, very interesting. I mean, was that sarcastic or? <laughs> it really wasn't. Okay, question number three Tin Sing Zhu. <laughs> Well, I, I feel now I have to keep going with testicles because it will be soon. So, yeah, testicles. Go, Ned. That is correct. You've got Phew. one right. So you've got one out of three. For a bonus point, can you tell me what language I said that in? Tin Sing Zhu. Taiwanese. Oh, incorrect. No bonus point for you. It was actually Vietnamese. One of the E's. Okay, question number four, and your word is Pocot. Pocot. Nomad. Well, you said that with some, um, with a serious face. Are you just trying to look confident, or have you heard that word before? Oh, I was just pretending to be confident. You are correct, it is nomad. So the yes. Pocot are a pastoralist people living in Kenya and Uganda who subsist by herding cows, sheep, and goats. They have a fascinating and beautiful material culture that includes intricately beaded jewellery and printed fabrics, but they are also well known for their folklore. The spoken word is very important for them, with proverbs, riddles and stories all making up important pieces of any Pocot child's education. There are about 700,000 Pocot today, and they have not yet abandoned the nomadic lifestyle for something more settled. I have, an also, I have another fun fact for you. Once men have been circumcised, they get a seat, okay? <laughs> By seat, I mean a chair. Only men can use these particular chairs, but it's like a really tiny little stool. Like, yeah, just literally a block of wood. So you can either sit on it or you can lay down and it's such a small seat that you can actually lay your neck on it, like your, the back of your head, so that you can lay down and watch your cattle or look out for an outbreak of a war. I watched a little video about it, if you can tell. <laughs> but um, yeah, like get your willy chopped off. Well, not chopped off. And <laughs> you get a seat. I've got a question for you now. Have you... I'd, I'd rather keep my foreskin. <laughs> I was going to say, have you been given a seat? Or have you not got a seat, Nick? Which one is it? I mean, I should know as your I wife, but... I haven't got a seat. <laughs> we've we've opened up on this podcast today. Me, I spoke about my mental health. We've spoke about your penis. 
No physical health. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Question number five. Right, your next word is cumin, or shall I say kaman? Cumin, kaman. I'm going. I'm going for nomad again. Nomad. Okay. You sure you really want to go nomad? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you are correct. That's another yes. point for you. They were members of a nomadic Turkish community until the Mongol invasion in 1237, which forced them to seek asylum in Hungary. I think it's Cumin. It's not Cumin. I wish it was Cumin, but it's Cumin. Cumin people were reported to have <laughs> mostly blonde hair, pale skin and blue eyes, which is very surprising knowing that they were a Turkish community to start with. In Slavic languages, they are also called Polovtsians. I'd say, or Polovtsi, meaning blonde, or Germanic speakers called them Folben, Valani, or Valve, also meaning pale. So, yeah, they probably looked a bit like me right now. Blonde hair, pale. I've got green eyes, but, you know. Well, Hitler would have loved them. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe he would have. Okay, final one. Kernski Yeldel. Kernski Yeldel. Kernski Yeldel. Mm. Last one was Gonad. Uh, I think that's Nomad. I think that's a group of people. Incorrect, my friend. Oh, it's a Gonad. A shocker. Can you have, just to redeem yourself, can you have a guess at what language you think that is? Say it again, please. Kernski Yeldel. Kernski Yeldel. Mm. Norwegian. Oh, a decent guess. Very decent. Or was it Finnish? No, the other one. Swedish. The other one. <laughs> um, Danish. Yes, it's Danish. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. Kernski Eldel. Wow, okay. That was very educational. Thank uh, you. There you go, you know, yeah. That's what this show's about. You laugh and you learn. <laughs> <laughs> live, love, live, love, l- let's. <laughs> live, love, learn. <laughs> Right, let's get back to reality with our dream lifestyle. Uh, you remember Kolya? You have the security of Airbnb, but you get a nicer price. Now let's find out his story, where he is now, and what he does for a living. So first of all, I'm in Brazil now. I'm lucky enough that my husband is Brazilian. So we were able to actually choose from a lot of different locations all over Europe and uh, here in South America, just because of rights as a citizen and we decided to move to brazil because we love brazil and uh, yeah we make our money uh, optimizing videos on youtube or all over the place on the internet basically it's very niche it's basically uh, seo so search engine optimization for videos we try to optimize the video's metadata in a way that people f- can find it more easily on the internet on google on youtube directly Give your company a little shout out. (laughs) Yeah, my company is called Zeostreamer OU. It's an Estonian company. Oh, okay. Now that you're married, that's so right that you both have different nationalities. You've kind of made each other stronger, right? So you have so many more options. So basically, people just need to get married to someone of a different (laughs) nationality. (laughs) I I mean, from my experiences, uh, people should get married. Definitely. I love it. And I would not do it in any different way. Yeah. But when it comes to residency, it definitely opens more doors if both partners have different, uh, different citizenships. So what's the number one reason to get married? Citizenship. Citizenship. (laughs) No. Or or love. (laughs) <laughs> love. I, I would. I would always uh, argue for love. I think that's that's the main thing. <laughs> I think it's important at this stage to uh, ask you where. Maybe they can tell by your accent, but where are you from? Yes, I'm from Germany near Frankfurt, but I've been traveling for four years now, four and a half by now, almost. Yeah. Wow. And so those four years. Am I right in saying that the first couple of years? You were essentially backpacking. You were in Trudy, your camper van. (laughs) But how long have you been a digital nomad for? Uh, That's really hard to say because like in the end, what's a digital nomad? It's somebody who works online from all over the world, basically. Then I probably have been a digital nomad even before I left 
Germany because I already did that. I already worked location independent at least a couple of uh, months before we left. And then we did leave. We uh, left for South America. We bought a VW uh, Kombi, like a Volkswagen Kombi here in Brazil, which is like the uh, Brazilian way of say bus. Like it's, it's like a small Volkswagen bus. And we transformed it into like a motorhome. And then we, yeah, went all over the place with that bus. So uh, after, after Brazil, we went to France. We went to Germany, of course, to just visit everybody. Uh, we went to Ukraine. Then uh, yeah, COVID hit and we got actually evacuated from Kiev, from Ukraine and yeah, went back to Germany. Then we spent uh, quite some time in Italy, in uh, Latvia, in Estonia, in Portugal. So basically all over Europe. But yeah, that was uh, mainly because of COVID, because we were still traveling while co uh, COVID was, was happening. And that obviously made us a little cautious. We really wanted to feel safe and secure. And then later on in 2022, we actually went to the United States. We went to Mexico, to Greece, lots of places, Austria, Switzerland. Wow. Something you mentioned earlier, or you, you mentioned Estonia twice. You said that you, you went there and you, you, st you stayed there, but also your company is registered there. Maybe this will be a good tip for anyone that wants to start an online business. Why the hell is your company registered in Estonia? So Estonian companies have uh, heaps of upsides, and uh, I think it would be probably too much information if I would just lay it out uh, here. But uh, yeah, get into it. It's super interesting. It's a very easy system. Uh, Estonia has something called uh, an e-residency, so you can have your electronic residency in Estonia, which is especially nice if you don't have a registered place where you are living, if you don't need to pay taxes because of your citizenship, like Americans, for example, for them, it's not ideal. But there are quite a few instances where an Estonian company makes a lot of sense. And I would highly recommend getting into that. Cool. To you, what are the pros and cons of this digital nomad life? So the pros are definitely that you get to see the world. It's amazing. Like that choice we made back in 2018 to leave was like the best choice ever. I think we were, yeah, we were on the precipice between like living a very ordinary normal life and living a great life. And right now we're living a great life and that would have never happened if we didn't make that decision. Having said that, I think the big downside on digital nomadism is definitely FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. It's really, really hard if you're next to like a beautiful beach to sit down and work. It's really, really hard if your friends go to a party on a beach or on the pool or whatever. And you're saying like, no, I have an appointment in two hours. I can't go. I can't drink. I can not do anything because the priority is always money. I think overall, I think the upsides definitely overshadow the downsides. So I, I'm interested to know for anyone listening who thinks they want to be a digital nomad, what advice would you give to someone? The general advice would be to do it. Just do it. And if you don't like it, you come back. Like I feel like our society is so afraid to, to fail, right? But there's no such thing as failing. You try it. If you don't like it, you don't do it. That's it. That's the end of the story. You didn't fail. Apart from that, when it comes to like practical advice, I would highly recommend like three, four, five months before you start, set up your routines, set up a gym routine, set up a dietary plan, set up structures in your life that you hold on to, especially when travel gets rough. I think that is something that we struggled with so, so much, especially if you're leaving every four, four weeks, right? If you're leaving the place, basically you arrive. You check out the city for a week, then you set up the routine for two weeks, and then the last week you're leaving again, kind of. And so having a, a good structured life and then leaving with that structure into uh, digital nomadism is, I think, a great way to prepare. Now, I want to go into a little section 
that where I can kind of geek out with you about credit card points. Now we have done a credit card points uh, episode before, which at the time I wasn't doing credit card points and I found it incredibly confusing. So I feel like when Gosh. people are into points, they they go, oh yeah, just grab it from here and then pay with that card and then pay it off with that card. And you're just like, whoa, that sounds like a lot of debt. That sounds really scary. But I've got a pretty, I think, basic way of telling you. So I'll tell you how we do it. This is all based in the UK, obviously, because we're from England. So maybe in your country, you might not be able to get a British Airways card, but we do it through a British Airways credit card because that gives us a bunch of points. So we can shop. If we spend money on that card, we get points. But the way we really use this to our advantage as digital nomads is because Obviously, in everyday life, if you just have an apartment, you can't pay your rent or your mortgage via your credit card. But when you're a digital nomad, obviously, you're buying accommodation through websites like Booking.com and Airbnb, which you can use your credit card for. So essentially, you're buying these high value ticket items like accommodation with a credit card, you're you're earning a ton of points. So even if you're not getting a special deal, say you pay a thousand pounds just as a as a your budget, a thousand pounds for your accommodation, that's a thousand points already on your card. So you're going to gain points real quickly, right? And the great thing about British Airways is they have something called a companion voucher, and what that is is if you spend. £12,000 on this credit card in a given year, you get given a companion voucher. So this happened to us. We were in, I mean, that's a lot of money. Can I just say like £12,000 is a lot of money. But if if you're paying for your accommodation and your food and your flights, I don't know, Christmas presents, anything on, if you spend everything on this credit card, I think like most people, you would spend around £12,000. But that companion voucher gives you a free flight for one of your friends. So the way that that worked was I'd accrued a certain amount of points, say it was, I don't know, 30,000 points, which is a decent amount. I used it to take us to Brazil. So I got a reduced flight because I used those 30,000 points to make mine cheaper, but I could then take a friend on that same flight with me completely for free. So when me and Nick went to Brazil, Nick's flight was totally for free. Before we move on to the next part of the show, I think it's just it's a good time to mention uh, doing this digital nomad life, we were working and you guys might be thinking, how were you working? How were you earning money? Well, it was in podcasting. We were, or we are, I've just left, I've left the business. Me and Amy were working together for almost three years as podcast producers, podcast managers, and podcast editors. So it was great. You know, all the years we were doing What the Foe, we learned skills. We've got all this experience in making podcasts, and we were actually able to help our clients make podcasts. So yeah, essentially, we were getting paid to make podcasts for other people. Now, of course, it could be a whole another episode in how do you grow a business? How do you know word of mouth recommendations from from clients? But slowly, it built up to a point where it was both of our jobs, and we we worked together, me and Amy, for about yeah, almost three years, about two and a half years, and that was great. Honestly, I've said to Amy, that's the best job I've ever had, being self employed. If we wanted to, we could be anywhere in the world. Yeah, it was all online. Working together was great. I've recently. I now I've abandoned Amy. She now works alone. I, I saw a job advertised. He uh, has a few left months. us. <laughs> yeah, it left us. I saw a job advertised a few months ago. It's still in podcasting, but it's it's making podcasts for a, a Premier League football team. And I thought that's tempting. Football podcasts. Uh, that that's like a dream job, right? And the job's still very new. It's going very well. It's sad to to leave Amy. Um, we live in Manchester, so people can decide which. <laughs> Which team? Where is it? Uh, Which team is it? But I just thought I would explain how we travelled and made money. Yep, our podcast management, editing, production business was all completely online. That's how we were able to work and travel.
G'day, my name is Michael Turtle. I've been a blogger for about 10 years and I do a little bit of travel writing along the way as well. That's Michael. He was part of a press trip that we went on around Austria in September 2022. And while we were waiting for our flight back home in Munich airport, it was a perfect opportunity to ask him about his digital nomad past. He starts by telling us how long he was able to work and travel for. Until COVID came along, I was traveling full time for about 10 years. So that's a long time to be without a permanent base, a permanent home. What would you say, I mean, for a lot of people, travel and working, it sounds like the dream life. What would you say the good things about it? And what would you say are the bad things about it? Look, there are lots of good things. I I really enjoyed the idea of not having a lot of commitment. And, you know, not in the way that my therapist tries to make me talk about not having, I'm kidding, I don't have a therapist, but it, it was nice to sort of not be tied down to anything in particular. You know, you were... You were free to move cities all the time. You you didn't have to sort of do a nine to five at a particular job anytime. You kind of just did what you wanted when you wanted. And that was actually quite liberating to be able to do that. I didn't really own any possessions. I wasn't paying a mortgage or a rent. And those things can be stressful. So not having any of that was was really nice. You know, the downside, of course, is that when you're working while you're traveling, you have to spend periods of time just sitting at a desk typing on a computer and what started to really annoy me was that I'd go to a really cool city that I'd never been to before and rather than spending my time exploring it hanging out having fun I would sit in a crappy little hotel room on my laptop just typing away Uh, and you know those kind of moments I sort of thought well wouldn't it be nicer to have a home somewhere so when you were actually having to sit there all day for a week working at least in the evenings you could catch up with your friends or go to your the sort of the gym or the restaurant or whatever that you like absolutely so a lot of people listening will think okay like i want to be a digital nomad some people won't want to some people like their home but if someone's listening and they want to be a digital nomad but they're thinking but how can i earn money by doing it first of all if you could let us know i mean don't tell me numbers and get let's not go into <laughs> specifics a billion dollars <laughs> but if you can let me know that how your income uh, came about but then ad- advice for someone else who wants to work remotely, what would you what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I earn most of my income from my travel blog and, you know, travel blogs sort of earn money a few different ways. It's a mixture of advertising. It's a mixture of commissions for things you're recommending. It's, a, um, you know, working with tourism boards and tour companies on campaigns or so on. So that's sort of, you know, putting that t- those things together along with a few other elements, you can earn a a very good income. It's like a little business, basically, that you're running. But my advice to most people would be don't do that. I think the problem a lot of people, the mistake a lot of people make is that they think if they're traveling all the time, their income has to be related to travel. I think actually what's a much better way to do it is say, you know what, I'm I'm a lawyer or I'm an accountant or I do any sort of other job which can be done remotely. I'll do that while I'm traveling for two reasons. A, you'll probably earn a lot more doing a, a real job for a company somewhere in the world that lets you do it remotely. But secondly, it means that the travel remains fun. Not that I have any regrets for the record, you know, despite what I say to my therapist. Um, I don't, second therapist reference. I don't have one. Um, but, <laughs> but a therapist would say the fact I've mentioned it twice probably means I need one. You're using humor uh, as a defense mechanism. I'm using I, humor I, as a defense <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, I think, for someone like myself, who was a journalist before I did this, I enjoy writing, I enjoy telling stories. So for me, it made sense. Like this is kind of the job I would always be doing in some way. But for people that don't necessarily have a, uh, a journalism background, a writing background, a photography background, I think don't try and, you know, shoehorn yourself into a, a sort of a travel blogging or an influencer kind of thing. If, if that's not where your skills lie, do what you enjoy, do what you're good at and have the travel on the side. Thanks a lot for that, Michael. Now we're going to move on to some questions we got from you guys. Uh, it was, this was over Instagram. Some questions you guys have about digital nomad lifestyle. So the first question comes from The Wandering Quinn. And she has asked, do you struggle sticking to a routine working for yourself? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I guess we did, especially digital nomad life. Yeah, it was hard to have a routine. Because if the weather's nice, it's like, oh, but I could stay and do work or I could stay 
and uh, on my laptop and do some business development and find new clients because when we were traveling our business did suffer because we weren't doing this um <laughs> but when the weather's nice and you're living near a beach or it's what Carl we said earlier you think oh but you know i'm only going to be here once when am i going to live here again and you choose the beach or you know whatever is is nearby on your doorstep and yeah we were kind of living for the moment day by day which i'm thinking this is great but actually yeah for business it wasn't great becky lovelock has asked how do you decide or schedule your hours to work and was it hard to stick to it so a little bit similar to the previous question uh but we just decided monday to friday nine to five ish what normal work hours that's what we're gonna do but whenever there was like uh, a national holiday like in the uk we'd call it a bank holiday if there was a national holiday in that country we we're in i remember one tuesday in portugal it was a national holiday for some reason and we were like well, okay <laughs> if the rest of the country are off <laughs> then we'll be too right the next question oh god your name what is your name pilgar pilgart explores how do you guys maintain a daily routine? Oh, was another one. Workouts, cooking, etc. whilst traveling. Yeah, I mean, we've been through a lot. Cooking, that was pretty easy. That was quite nice because in Lisbon, we keep talking about Lisbon, but it's because it was the only good time we had. But um, we went to like the old school fruit and veg shops and that I really loved because like you can really use, like practice your Portuguese and it was like you paid with cash and coins and you weigh it. And I just, it felt like a really like local experience because I don't think we have any shops like that in Manchester. It's a very modern city. So yeah, I quite liked going to the shops doing that. I don't think that even answers your question. It was about cooking. I hated cooking with living digital nomad life because the kitchens were always crap with the place we lived. There was never enough like spatulas and knives and things like that. I hate shopping in a foreign supermarket, not because I think everything should be English. It's just food I don't recognize. I don't know what to cook. And I haven't traveled to Lisbon or Barcelona or Brazil to eat my rubbish <laughs> cooking. I've traveled there to eat the local food. and You can't eat out every day because that's too expensive. So that's just something else I didn't like about that lifestyle. I hated going to a supermarket and I hated cooking. <laughs> So yeah, all the questions are pretty similar. <laughs> I didn't didn't prep that very well. <laughs> but um, there you go. Hopefully you got your answer because you got it three times. Yeah, but that just shows uh, what people's main concern is with this lifestyle is, is routine. And what I've learned is that, yeah, routine is actually very good for your, for your mental and physical health and, f- and for work. Routine is good for everything, all aspects of your life, to be honest. It sounds boring, but it's, it's actually very good for you. Yeah, I completely agree. And like, we're always like, oh, we're travelers, like we're so spontaneous and cool. But but actually, like now, maybe just because we're in our 30s now, we're just like, I love to get to bed at a sensible hour. You know, I want to eat a healthy diet and I want to like repair myself. I'm all about (laughs) self-love. That came out wrong. (laughs) But yeah, just looking after yourself where like that's really hard when you've you know, you've been traveling, you're in a place you don't know, you need to research it and you need to research in the next place that you're going to. You also need to keep up with the entire business that you're running, like all of that. And then you this health on top. It's, it's a lot, man. And actually just living in a home is just great. Our advice, if someone listening and and they want to become a digital nomad, mine would be, you just have to think about what what, like online skill um, can you offer? And ours was podcast editing, video editing, you know, blogging, writing, consulting on something. But you just have to think, yeah, what is what is this the skill you have? And if you don't have a skill, that's fine. Then you think, well, what are my interests? So our interest was, was podcasting. And when you're interested in something, you're happy to put the hours in to to keep playing around with it, keep practicing. And the more you do your hobby, which our our hobby is and and was podcasting, the more you do your hobby, just the better you get at it. And then eventually someone's going to want to pay you for it. Absolutely. That's what we did. I mean, earlier you said that 
we started this podcast and then started offering it. But I also did have a background in radio, just so you know. <laughs> we didn't just do one podcast and we're like, we're experts. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of work there. Like for years, I worked in the radio industry in the UK for the BBC, for Kiss FM, a bunch of stations. Um, and then started What the Foe. So, you know, there was a real background of audio there, how to tell a story, things like that. So yeah, like like you said, just look at your interest. For me, my biggest piece of advice is when you're trying to become a digital nomad, when you're looking for which country you're going to visit next, I would say highly prioritize places where you either have friends who are coming with you or you already know someone in that country. I think that was the biggest reason why uh, Lisbon was so successful. We had two Brazilian friends there that we hung out with a lot and it made our trip. That's who we went to Algarve with. We also had some friends from the UK come over for that trip. And that was the best part of it, you know, being with people. And I think that's what travel is all about, right? Local people or the other travelers that you're with, they really do make the experience and it's the same for digital nomad life. I do want to add one more thing. It's actually some some practical advice. You might think, okay, I have a skill in something, video editing. Now what? How do I let the world know, you know, that I'm available for hire? You can check out websites like um, is it freelancer.com, Upwork, Fiverr, these kind of freelance websites. They're not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of them. That they're, they're they're not very good, but they're a good place to start. But also go on. LinkedIn. A lot of people think LinkedIn, which is kind of true, they think LinkedIn is like this really boring corporate business social media which, uh, platform, which it kind of is, but actually it's really powerful. It's it's really good. Get on LinkedIn, connect with people, start conversations. And the best way to start being a podcast editor or a video editor is to say, I am this. I am a video editor. Let me know if you need help with your videos. You have to, yeah, you have to put it out there. You have to tell someone. Otherwise, no one's going to know that you have this skill to offer. If you don't ask, you don't get. And like me and Nick have particularly learned that this year. I mean, we're open and honest with you all the time that uh, recently we're getting a lot of sponsored trips. And I think a lot of like particularly influencers will be like, oh, I was contacted by this brand because they wanted to work with me. Like, we, well, I say we, Nick has been out there emailing tourist boards, people that we can work with so that we can bring you more content, right? So this isn't just falling on our laps. We've been working hard in the background. And that's just one example, you know, that we're, we're getting to do some press trips uh, to bring more content. But it was the same with our business, you know, constant emailing people, knocking down doors saying like, hi, do you need help with your podcast? And you feel cheeky and you feel rude, but at the end of the day, get over it because it's going to earn you money and you can live like this life that you want to live and just hustle, 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 hustle and you'll get mm -hmm. what you want. Yeah. And although we don't think digital nomad life is great, what is the best thing and what is priceless is being your own boss and having that freedom. That's the best thing ever. And I know- and I've, Do you I've, have I've, that, Nick? Or? Yeah, I know. I know I've now given that up. <laughs> <laughs> But it was for, it's for dream job, man. Like, come on. If you can't have freedom, then at least work for a Premier League football team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally do it, but yeah. no, being your own boss is amazing. Out of the whole digital nomad thing, that's my favorite thing, right? And we love travel. I mean, we have a travel podcast, so we're obsessed with it. But being my own boss is, oh, it's just great. I love it so much. So, Guys, I really hope this episode has helped you. Maybe you've been thinking about it for a while and this has like opened your eyes to it and it's you thought, actually, yeah, I can get over those negatives. It's really something I want to do. But we really just hope that we've painted an honest picture of what it's like. It's not sunflowers and roses and just having a, a great time because there is a lot of that, but there's a lot of negatives to it as well. And some people on the internet just need to be a little bit a little bit more honest so that's what we're trying to do because there's far too many people just like stephanie said on the beach with their laptops pretending that they're having a great time but actually they're not getting their work done on the beach come on they're not so let's stop all this misinformation and be honest that it's hard sometimes it's worth it sometimes it's not amen see you next time guys bye bye I'm all about self-love. Get your willy chopped off. 
before we wrap this up, we've got a question for you. Is your boy Tarquin going on a gap year? Is your gal pal Rachel off to eat, pray, love herself silly? Then the best way to support this show is to share it with all your travel buddies. Thanks, Thanks. bye! Bye.